Good evening, good morning, and good day, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm Adam Lewis, going to talk about the Digital Earth Africa, uh, Continental Open Data Cube. I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation uh, and the Open Data Cube Steering Committee, in and in particular, Alex Leith. It's great to see the Open Data Cube conference continuing to grow in scale and, and depth. It's nice to reflect on the history of the data cubes from the first one we built in 2013, the Australian Geoscience Data Cube, through to the Open Data Cube, which was um, created in a pub in Canberra in 2016. And Simon Oliver can take credit for the name there with people like Brian Kilo playing a key roles in international promotion. And then Digital Earth Australia coming into being in 2017-18 for D Africa in early 2019 became a thing. And with each of those steps, there's been an evolution in the technology and the data and the partnerships, the governance and the community, uh, and, and not to mention in scale and data depth. Uh, it's a really exciting process. <clears throat> Digital Earth Africa is working to a vision developed by our African stakeholders, and that is to deliver an op operational infrastructure for Earth observation data that will produce and deliver decision-ready products that enable decision makers, scientists, the private sector and NGOs and so on to inform decisions on the continent and also to empower the private sector so we're growing an ecosystem for innovation and access. Uh, we have a board, we have a technical advisory committee seen here and we have some key funders, the Australian Government, the Helmsley Charitable Trust and patrons that grip on earth observation. We have a network of people who are absolutely vital to this program Two key people, staff in Africa, Edward and Ken, who do a tremendous job of leading in Africa, uh, as well as our in implementing partners in the regional institute, institutes that range from South Africa through to Tunisia, and then more people still on our technical advisory committee who span the continent from Madagascar through to um, Senegal. Technically, we're at a really exciting point with DE Africa. We have continental coverage from ALOS and as of this week from Landsat and Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1. It's an amazing thing to have full resolution data for such a vast continent, but more impressive still is to have the operational pipelines in place that provide the data every day. So roughly half a petabyte of Landsat, a similar volume to Sentinel-1, <clears throat> and almost two petabytes of Sentinel-2 uh, data. Those data come through a pipeline, they're converted to COG and stack. But equally importantly, from a scientific and application perspective, is that they are analysis ready data. <clears throat> a key strategic decision for DE Africa is that we want to use only ARD from the international community following the CEOS ARD specifications. Producing that ourselves isn't viable other than as a short term fix, and we therefore take data from USGS and ESA and JAXA as they produce it, more or less. Um, for Sentinel-1 radar data, however, there's no international supply of CLS ARD from ESA. So we've developed a pipeline working with Synergize that we're promoting to become an international standard, which we hope that ESA, hint, hint, and the European Commission will continue after this calendar year. <clears throat> from a scientific point of view, this amazingly rich data sets open up all sorts of potential. Uh, it's really about in a scientist's mind, one data set, multiple different measurements, the surface reflectance being the start point, vegetation indices being another measurement, water indices, another measurement, water quality indices, another me measurement, temperature measurements from the satellite, uh, from the temperature instruments on Landsat are another instrument telling you land surface temperature, roughness from ALOS and from Sentinel-1, the annual variation statistics of those data, if you want them, and so on. So this is an amazingly rich data set um, that has never before been available to exploit, uh, let alone at such scale. <clears throat> and of course, one can look at differences because there is a time se sequence happening here. Equally important, exciting is we can go to places um, in near real time. And here we're looking at Goma uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, Sentinel-2 image shows cloud, uh, but beyond the Sentinel-2 image is a Sentinel-1 image, touch wood.
which shows that underneath that cloud, there are lava flows coming from the mountain down to the airport in Goma. Being able to provide those data reasonably quickly uh, at, in times of need is really pretty exciting. And also we can look at things like floods and here's the floods in the Sudan in September 2020. The model of this is of course to have a data cube, a continental data cube powered by the open data cube that's addressing critical agendas, agenda 2063, the sustainable development goals, the Sendai framework, the climate challenges of the continent, as well as driving development and innovation in Africa. To do that, <clears throat> we're not just bringing in the data. The data are great and they're groundbreaking, but the differentiator will be when we produce operational services, such as water observations from space, crop land map, annual geomedians, measurements like fractional cover that go beyond the data and start to produce decision ready information that decision makers can engage with much more easily. And that is a key part of our agenda. We have a training program um, looking forward. Uh, a major part of the program is training and we're using our regional partners who we featured earlier. They'll be at the front line of becoming trainers and then rolling out training within countries and institutes across Africa. Really exciting, we have a growing user community. They engage with DE Africa through a range of interfaces, but the most exciting of those is probably the bottom right here, the, the sandbox users who've grown from a, few, from a handful um, a year ago through to over 700 today. So there are many users. And then there are secondary interfaces like the Esri Geo Portal, which we're now um, taking control of. Uh, and thank you to Esri for the Geo Portal. So the data can be accessed in many different ways. We're running awareness raising sessions, it's multilingual. Um, and we're starting to see really exciting things with innovators like Stella here, exploring how the data through the sandbox can be used to support a range of different applications from crops in Kenya through to um, illegal mining in Ghana. Some of the most exciting of those are <clears throat> where we, we've got groups that are looking at exactly how they can interface with decision makers. How do we take the data to decision makers and the products from that? And in Tanzania, they're particularly focused on how to report against the sustainable development goals. Here's the example from, from Ghana, where the parliament, the, the ruling parties in parliament, called a data fair to look at all the information they have at their fingertips. And we were able to participate in that. And the image on the right is indicative of of the problems they have with unregulated mining. As I said earlier, the key to differentiating, the key to real value is going to be from continental products that we can produce. And we have developed an, in the pipeline a number of those. Uh, very exciting and most recent is the Geomedian. This is a, an integration of a year of Sentinel-2 data. On the left gives you the cloud-free 10 meter, re meter resolution image. And on the right, the, the the statistical deviations around that over a period of a year. And those become an incredibly rich source of data for things like machine learning. And machine learning is what underlies our crop mask product. So this is a, a new product being developed now. It's looking really exciting. It's taking the dynamics of the vegetation and a range of other measures and developing machine learning algorithms or using machine learning algorithms to develop decision trees to map crops across Africa. And it's looking really promising. One of the reasons it's so promising is that we're using our people in Africa from those regional institutions again to capture the validation and training data. So this becomes, and that also gives immense ownership of the products. As I mentioned earlier, we have the water observations from space product, which has already been produced as a provisional product that will now become operational. Now that we have the, the Landsat data as an operational data service. We know that the, va the value from this is immense. We've done work with the World Economic Forum to look at how many billions of dollars, this, a few of the improvements that might come through Earth observation being applied effectively across a few industries literally translates into billions of dollars of value for Africa if we can unlock that potential through platforms like Digital Earth Africa. So that's pretty exciting. We're currently focused on how we transition uh, this into Africa and how we sustain it. So we're now moving the capability into Africa. We'll have a program management office announced soon in Africa. And we'll start to look at how the core software team moves into Africa, how that capability is transitioned 
uh, to the continent to continue and to continue to be part of the international network of software developers. Uh, we're looking at ensuring that there's national and international support to continue funding the capability and realizing the vision of an Africa-led and owned and ongoing infrastructure capability. Thank you.